Well, good morning. Glad to have you uh, with us this morning. If those who may not know, my name is Brian Robertson, and I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and I'm very grateful to have you uh, with us this morning as we gather in the name of Jesus, as we do uh, every weekend, to be reminded of who God is, who we are, and what God may be calling us into. Uh, we're in the middle of a teaching series that we're calling Full Attention, where we're seeking to understand how can we love God with more of who we are? How can we experience a more deep, uh, robust understanding of our life with God? Jesus was asked at one point to sum up all of the law and the prophets and all the things in the Old Testament, all of the things, to whittle it down, the teacher tells him and says, give me what's the most important commandment of everything around. And Jesus' response there is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so it's this first part of the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we're trying to understand how can we do that practically better uh, over these next couple of weeks? How can we train ourselves to become people who love the, God, who love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? So we're seeking to understand how we can give God our full attention, how we can cut away some of the distractions and some of the things around our life. Well, what are some practices that we can train ourselves with to pay attention to what God is doing? And at the beginning of this series last week, we talked about how we didn't want to just talk about things. We didn't want to just stay in the hypothetical, theoretical kind of stuff or just kind of intellectual game. But we actually wanted to get, some, get down into some practices and train ourselves and to work at this together. How can we train ourselves to understand to have a deeper life with God? So this morning I want us to consider what it looks like to have a space in our life, to create space in our life to hear from God? How do we create space? How can we train ourselves to have margin, in other words, in our life that we can experience a divine encounter with God in our everyday life? How can we do that? And to help us understand how we do that, we're going to look at Moses' life a little bit this morning. Part of Moses' life that Carla read for just a few moments ago, understanding how God spoke and how he was able to hear, how Moses was able to hear from God in those times. So as we kind of get into this a little bit, let me pray for us, and then we'll see what God may teach us together this morning. Jesus, we're humbled by you and by your presence. I pray that uh, what we talk about this morning would be fueled by your Spirit, that he would have his way in our midst this morning, and that we would be receptive. Train us to be attentive to you, to not just talk a good game, but to train ourselves to be receptive and to walk in obedience to your will and your, your way in our life. It's in your name pray. Amen. Many of us are familiar with the story of Moses. And even if you've not been around the church for very long, some of us, many of us have watched the movie Prince of Egypt, the, the Disney movie that depicts the story of Moses. But I thought it would be helpful for us just to kind of speed over and kind of give us a flyover of Moses' life to get, get under some context of the story that Carla read for us just to, out of Exodus chapter 3. So let me give us a, a quick flyover about Moses. Moses was a pillar of our faith. He, he led the Israelites out of captivity, out of Egypt, and brought them into the desert, preparing them for the promised land. He met with God face to face as a friend would meet, and he dialogued with God. He intervened on behalf of the Israelites and he prayed diligently with God. He led the people very well. He brought them the Ten Commandments. He, his life has been summed up by, by many people in three kind of phases or three kind of seasons of his life. The, the first season or the first kind of third of his life where he was kind of grow, grown up as somebody, where he, he kind of knew things and he had a, a vision of his life. And then the, the second season of his life was a season of doubt and a season where stripped of all the things that he thought was valuable and he kind of struggled with kind of thinking that he was really nobody when he thought he was somebody at one point. And then the final third of a season of his life where he was realizing and learning what God can do with someone who realizes that they're nobody. What God can do with them, how he can lead them and mold them and shape them and and, uh, pursue a God life with them. God's grace in Moses' life is seen all throughout all three of the seasons, all three of the phases of Moses' life. You can see God's grace and God's hand all written all throughout his life. 
And as a baby, Moses was born in Egypt, the time when the Israelites were slaved, and Pharaoh was kind of, had an oppressive regime over the Israelites. And Pharaoh got concerned about the growing number of Israelites, so he made a command or an edict that all these, these boys were to be thrown into the Nile River, to just kill them, throw them into the Nile. Moses' mom was afraid for his life, and so she hid him for a few months and just kind of kept him secret. And when she couldn't keep him secret any longer, she made a little basket and put him in the basket and sent him down the Nile, floating down there. It's just a last-ditch effort to save his life. Well, Moses is found by Pharaoh's daughter, and she has compassion on him. She sees his face, his tender eyes, and she has compassion on him, brings him to the palace herself, and she nurtures him, and she raises him in the palace, uh, surrounded by all the virtue and the values and the wealth and the status that was all in the palace. He was, had access to all the best things that Egypt could ever give you, all the education and, and all the means that Egypt has. And so it's, it's kind of understandable that in this third of his life, this beginning of Moses' life, that he thought he was somebody. He had value. He had status. He had wealth. He walked down the streets, and everyone knew who Moses was. He was somebody. But when you notice one of his fellow Hebrews being mistreated by an, uh, by an, an Egyptian, the anger in him stirred and this want for justice stirred in him and his anger got the best of him. He, he intervened and he ended up killing the Egyptian. And he thought he could get away with it. He thought his power, he thought his, his wealth, he thought his value, he thought his status would kind of, kind of let him get away with it. But his crime was seen. And all of his status and all of his wealth couldn't protect him. And so he was, he was sent off into the desert. He fleed for his life. And it was in this center part of his life that he struggled, realizing that he really wasn't who he thought he was. His value wasn't there. His, all of the wealth and everything that he thought he was somebody was now stripped away from him. And now he was nobody, leading in an ordinary life in, in no man's land, just kind of out there. And it's in the middle of his story, right there in the middle of his story, where he's just living an ordinary life in Midian. He marries a Midianite woman. They have some children. He just lives a seemingly insignificant life. He's he's tending the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro, just kind of hanging out. But God had heard the cries of his people in Egypt and he had heard the, of their oppression and he, had sound, he found he was going to do something about it. And Moses, in this middle part of his life, was going to find out what God can do with somebody who thinks they're a nobody. Moses was about to find out in this interaction, this encounter that God has for him changes Moses' life, changes all of Israel's life because of this divine encounter. In the middle part of Moses' life where he thinks he's nobody, leading a very ordinary life, far removed from all the status and the pomp and circumstance of Egypt, and he's just a shepherd in the desert of Midian trying to squeak out a living. But as we unpack his story here in this encounter of this divine encounter of a bush that was on fire and yet not consumed, where Moses turns his attention and he learns something about God and about his life with God. As we unpack that and how we can understand how we can give God our full attention, I want us to notice a few things. And the first thing I want us to notice ought to be an encouragement for each one of us. The first thing I want us to notice is that God is always at work in our life. In Moses' life, in your life, and in my life. You can see God, the hand of God moving all throughout Moses' life and rescuing him from the, the evil of Pharaoh and establishing him a passion for justice and giving him an education, training him as a leader. You can see where Moses' upbringing and his, and his background gave him the right place and the right time to be used by God. But as you dig into Moses' divine encounter, I simply want us to be encouraged this morning that whatever your background is, whatever your family history has been, whatever your experience with God has been, God has been at work in your life regardless of what is going on when you think you're just seemingly going through the motions just having an ordinary life nothing is wasted in God's economy it may feel like you're not doing anything substantial it may feel like you're not doing anything out of the ordinary 
You're just going to school. You just got your job. You're just trying to raise your kids as best you can. You're just doing everything that everybody else you think is supposed to be doing. But nothing is wasted in God's economy. And it may feel like it's just an ordinary time. It just may feel like an ordinary day. But you will see that God, God's purposes for you will come to pass in His timing and in His way. Because God is always at work in our life. God is always at work. The Apostle Paul picks up on this theme in the Newer Testament book of Romans, his letter to his friends in Rome in chapter 8, verse 28, when he says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Friends, one of the ways you can develop a deeper relationship with God, a deeper experience with God, is to recognize that he has been at work throughout your life. Throughout your life. When you have not been aware of it, and when you have been aware of it. Oftentimes it's in times of reflection when you look back on your life and you think back, well, 10 years ago I can see where God was working. Or, or five years ago I can see what God was doing here. You can see the hand of God molding and guiding and shaping you along the way. You can see that. And when we do see it in hindsight, we ought to praise God. But this morning I want to ask the simple question, how do you train yourself to be more aware of God's working in your life in the present tense? To not wait for 10 years to look back and go, oh, I see where God was doing things. But to be present and be aware of what God is doing and to train yourself to see his act and his hand moving and shaping and molding your life in the present tense. To not wait to go, oh, I think maybe God was doing something. In order to do that, I simply want to say it's often in the ordinary things of life that we meet God. It's often living an ordinary life. That we meet God. And when I say that, I know ordinary is not a very exciting word. It's kind of a boring word. Ordinary. Communicates this sort of kind of boring existence. Nothing really special about ordinary. But let's face it, right? Most of our life is rather ordinary. It's it's in the ordinary that you actually live. It's in the ordinary that you live. I just officiated a wedding yesterday and they surprised me because cody and kelsey are here this morning so congratulations congratulations but i said this i said this at their wedding and i've said this at other weddings as well the ceremony is great everyone's smiling everyone's dressed to the nines it's a fun experience everyone is having a good time the reception is fun everyone's taking these pictures memories are being made all that kind of stuff But a mark of a healthy relationship, of a healthy marriage, isn't in a beautiful ceremony. It's found in the everyday ordinary. It's found when you roll over and you wake up next to somebody and they've got hideous morning breath and they go, good morning. (laughs) And your eyebrows burn off and that kind of stuff. It's learning to love someone in the ordinary because that's where the... That's where maturity and that's where beauty of relationship happens is in the ordinary. It's the same with our life with God. Special events and circumstances and prayer meetings and retreats and all those things can deepen our life with God. And they are very important. They are very good. But we need to learn to see God in the ordinary, in the everyday. Develop what theologian Dr. Paula Gooder calls the spirituality of ordinariness love that phrase spirituality of ordinariness this is what she writes in her book uh, everyday god we need to learn to be ordinary people who can celebrate god in the ordinary things of life need to be alert to the possibility that this event or that encounter might just provide us with a glimpse of glory it's what the 17th century monk brother lawrence called the practicing the presence of god to learn to do the dishes and fold the laundry and take the kids someplace and do homework and do your job in the presence of god in the ordinary where he's working and he's molding you and he's shaping you Because God shows up in the spectacular. He shows up in special services. He shows up in special ceremonies, for sure. But he also shows up in the ordinary, in the everyday. It happened for Moses. It happened for Moses. 
Now, God showed up in an extraordinary way in a bush that was on fire that didn't, wasn't being consumed, but Moses was, wasn't planning on that. He didn't set out that morning to go, you know, today I'm going to have an encounter with, Jesus, with God. I'm just going to go. He didn't walk himself to some place and say, I'm going to go do this. It was going through the ordinary stuff of life. He was tending the sheep, and he found, and he saw this bush that was on fire, and bushes caught on fire in the desert quite often, actually. But he noticed something specific about this, and it caught his attention, and so he turned aside and looked, paid a little more attention. It was an ordinary day for him, in other words, and yet God was at work in an ordinary day, in some ordinary desert in Midian. But Moses was alert. So the first thing I want you to notice about life with God is that God is always at work in your life. God is always at work in the ordinary stuff even. Second thing I want us to notice, and that is Moses' willingness to turn aside. His willingness to turn aside. Turning aside involves a choice. Because there's always alternatives. They could always keep going the same direction. You can always be distracted. Moses could have had a whole lot of things on his mind. A whole slew of things going through his mind that would have kept him distracted. Jethro could have been on his back about all these sheep. And i got to make sure they're done right. i got to make sure they're fed the right way. Exercise. All these kind of things. And while I see this bush that's over there, that's kind of a, a thing that happens sometimes. And it's pretty cool. But i got all these things going on. But yet the choice to turn aside and pay attention... Moses showed, demonstrates a willingness to turn aside, a willingness to be distracted and, and to see what God is up to. And it will be difficult for you and I, it would be difficult for us to nurture a life with God, a deep life with God, when we have not yet nurtured space in our life to turn aside, to look. Notice what verse 4 says. This is so crucial. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. See, when Moses demonstrates a willingness to be diverted from his own agenda and the various stuff he had to do that day, the schedule, to pay attention, God spoke. God spoke. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, then God spoke. Then God spoke. God was looking for a person with a long enough attention span, with enough margin in his life to not be rushed past one thing after the next after another, and could slow down long enough to pay attention and to attend. When God had seen that Moses was willing to slow down and pay attention, then God spoke. Perhaps you haven't heard the Lord speak recently because you haven't demonstrated a willingness to have margin in your life and to slow down and to turn aside and to look. Friends, if you want a deep life with God, if you want to nurture a life with God that is life-giving and present tense, then you and I are going to have to nurture a willingness to turn aside and listen pay attention and that's going to have to deal with the third thing i want to talk about and that is hurry sickness that we suffer from we suffer from hurry sickness pastor and author john orberg in his book the life you've always wanted writes this hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day hurry can destroy our souls Hurry can keep us from living well. For many of us, the great danger is not that we renounce our faith, is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for mediocre mediocre 
version of it. Perhaps one of the reasons that Moses is available to God's call on his life and what God is going to do in his life to experience a closeness and a deep relationship with God is because he had space and he wasn't hurried and he gave God his full attention. Perhaps more accurately, it's not that he had space. It's not that you have it. It's that he created it. There were still things to do. There were still places to take the sheep and to t- tend them the way they needed to go and to think about supper and make things ready for things. But Moses created space. I love Orberg's quote here, and this is the part of it that I can't get rid of in my mind. Many of us, the great danger is not that we renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. Let's be honest. If you don't create space in your life to push against the sickness of hurry and you don't slow down, if you don't create it and be intentional about it, well then the schedule and the hurry and the busyness will take over. I know it does for me. And I want to suggest as we look at Moses' life, I want to suggest for you and I this morning that what God is looking for from each of us is a willingness to create space, to push against the hurry sickness of our culture and to pay attention. But how do you do that? with all the demands and all the things that our job requires of us and all the things that our kids have to get to, how do you do that? How do you create space to pay attention? And here I'm just going to give a a very quick, shameless plug for our next apprenticeship course. It starts in November, and it's on this very thing. It's It's actually on learning to keep the Sabbath, to push against the, and to resist the culture of now and hurry and to create a rhythm of life, of rest and of Sabbath. Starts in November. It's a, it costs 15 bucks for the material, but it's well worth your time, well worth the $15. There'll be somebody out in the lobby this morning. You can register for that course even this morning. But to create space, to be intentional about creating space. And how do you do that? For all of us this morning, I want to introduce this practice of a, of a prayer that we can begin to do. And we can practice this on a daily basis to create space in our life to pay attention. And it's the practice of the prayer of examine. Of examine. Examine is a reflective daily prayer that seeks to ask the simple question, where is God in my midst today? Where was God doing? What was he up to? If we believe that God is working all the time and his presence is near to us, then the prayer of examine daily just simply asks the question, where was God doing? What was he up to in my life today? It begins with this aspect that God is near and active all the time, and we reflect on our day to seek to discern what was God stirring, what was he doing, and what might we learn about who God is, about who we are, and what God may be calling us to, do, to be and to do tomorrow. So prayer of examine is a daily reflective prayer. And I told you at the beginning here that we were going to move past the intellectual kind of theoretical fa- phrase or, or phase of life stuff. And we actually begin to practice some of these things to train ourselves to pay attention. The prayer of examine is five quick steps in them. And Judy, you can put those up on the slides there. If you're someone who's writing down or take notes or you've got a camera wants to take a a picture of this or a phone wants to take a picture of this, these would be good things to jot down or to write down or to snap a picture. These five steps in the prayer of examine on a daily basis. The first thing is we slowly become aware of God's presence. That we just look back on the events of our day and it may be like this jumbled mess of what happened here, there, that sort of thing. But we just look back and we ask God to bring clarity to our day, to our day. Just become aware that God was in our midst and what happened during that day. The second step is we review the day or the week with gratitude. 
We look at the work we did, the people we interacted with. We, we notice all the joys, the delights, the gifts that we received in that day or in that week that just happened. And we pay attention, again, to the ordinary things, the, the food we had or the, the person we interacted with or the sights you saw, the places you went to. You just simply review the day with gratitude, with gratitude. Third thing, you pay attention to your emotions over this past week. What was I feeling during the day? When I saw that, when I interacted with that person, did I feel bored through my day? Was I excited? Was something happening that that was a a good thing? Was I frustrated? Was I hurt? Was I sad? Just pay attention to your emotions. And more than likely, God will show you a time or two, a thing or two that you have fallen short But look deeper than just the surface level of stuff. Look a little bit deeper and have a sense of what God may be stirring. How is he asking you to grow in this area? If you found yourself kind of bored throughout the day, maybe God is asking and stirring you to grow in patience. Or maybe to grow in gratitude for the simple things. And you realize that you're you're only thankful for the big, great things. And you are not so grateful for just the mundane, ordinary Pay attention to your emotions and what is God stirring in you. And then choose one event or one thing, one aspect of the day, and turn that into a prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct you to one thing, something that happened during the day or during the week. And it may evolve an emotion or something that happened. It may be an encounter that you had with somebody, a conversation that you had with somebody, a moment of joy, or or maybe even something that seems really insignificant. Just something that that God thinks is important and your mind is drawn back to that conversation or back to that event. Choose that and then turn that into a prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to draw your attention to it. And then how do you pray for that? That interaction that you had with your coworker, that for some reason the Holy Spirit is bringing that interaction back to your mind. And now you turn that into a prayer. Lord, how can I pray for that? Is it a prayer for intercession, for that God would be near to them? Is it a prayer for repentance of how you treated them? Is it a prayer of gratitude for the words that they spoke into your life? Turn that encounter into a prayer. And then lastly, you look forward for the next day. You project the next day's challenges and the next day's things that are on your plate and what's going to happen, and you ask the Spirit of God to give you grace to be aware and be the Christ-like person that he wants you to be tomorrow and the next week. That's the prayer of examine. It doesn't take forever. It doesn't take forever. It doesn't mean you have to carve out three hours every night to sit down and kind of have a journal in hand and, you know, thumb through and all these little pages. It takes a few moments. But it's going to take intentionality and it's going to take the perspective of creating the space. Otherwise, the sickness of hurry will creep in and it will drown out your life with God. Intentionality and purpose to create space to have a prayer of examine of what was going on this last day or a week. So again, I'm not going to push past this. We're going to try that right now. I'm going to give you a little bit of space, a little bit of time to do this prayer of examine. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get yourself comfortable. I want you to quiet your hearts, bow your heads, close your eyes, quiet yourselves a little bit. And I'm just going to lead you through this prayer of exam. It won't take forever. Just take a few minutes. I want you to think and to simply ask where God is stirring in your life throughout your day. And for this purpose, we're going to use this last week. All right, from last Sunday, all this whole week until this morning. So if you would, close your eyes, bow your heads. Just slowly become aware of God's presence in your week. Look back on the events of this past week. I know it might be a jumbled mess, but just slowly look back chronologically. What did you do? Who'd you meet with? Where'd you go?
as you think back on your week, review these events with gratitude. Notice the joys of this week. What gift did you receive from somebody relationally, emotionally, spiritually? What gift did you receive from somebody this week? And don't forget to pay attention to the ordinary things, the food you ate, the sights you saw. Pay attention to your emotions. What did you feel this week? Now choose one aspect of your week. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct you to something God thinks is important from your week. An encounter with someone, a conversation, just one event this past week. Turn that event into a prayer. Maybe a prayer of intercession, a prayer of praise, of repentance. Turn that event into a prayer. Now look forward to this week. Ask God to give you grace for this week's challenges. Pay attention to how you're feeling. Are you nervous for this week? Hesitant? Pray and ask God's grace to be evident in your life to walk consistently with Him. Jesus, I pray for this week that we would create space to be attentive. We thank you that you've been moving and directing us and give us the courage to be obedient. That this week we may walk in step with your spirit. It's in your name.